I am calling the Monday, February 7th, Parks and Natural Resources Commission meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. Tonight's Parks and Natural Resources Commission meeting will be held in person by, be held just in person tonight. I will be leading the Parks and Natural Resources Commission meeting and the public is welcome to participate when invited. Members of the public may attend the person in meeting or in person if attendees to experience audio problems. Well, tonight we're having some technical issues, so there will be no audio or there will be no virtual meeting tonight due to the technical difficulties. Um, so we apologize for the inconvenience that this may have caused anyone who is hoping to attend virtually. Um, as usual, tonight's available meeting, tonight's meeting is available on BCTV and the city's website. If you are unable to participate and would like to submit public testimony, I do encourage you to email your comments to city staff or mail your comments directly to City Hall. Um, another change to tonight's agenda, the Amalgamate Pickleball Court discussion has been moved to March 6th, 2023 PNRC meeting. Um, and now on to the adoption of the agenda. Do any members of the commission have any changes to the agenda? Nope. How about staff? Nothing from staff. All right. Uh, may I have a motion for the adoption of tonight's agenda? I move to adopt the um, agenda. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right. Perfect. The motion passes. Um, and now the approval of the minutes. Um, let's consider approval of the December 3rd, 2022 Parks and Natural Resources meeting minutes. Commissioner, are there any changes? No. Um, staff, any changes to the meeting minutes? Nothing from staff. Perfect. May I have a motion to approve? So move. A second? Second. And the motion passes. Are there any members that are present tonight who wish to speak? All right. Um, and now let's move on to the presentation of Amalgamate Park Natural Resources Restoration Plan. Um, Caleb, we would love to have you. All right, thank you for having me, commissioners. Uh, my name is Caleb Ashling. I'm a natural resources specialist for the city of Burnsville. And I'm excited to be here tonight to talk about uh, some planning that we've been doing at Al Magnet Park uh, to do some restoration work out there over the coming years. Uh, so just a quick outline of what uh, I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we're going to go over uh, um, a bit of an overview and background on the Yellow Magnet Park restoration plan. I talk a little bit about the city's general management approach with restoration. Uh, talk about the implementation and then talk about next steps as well. And then at the uh, end, I'm going to also invite up uh, one of our partners, uh, Mike Lynn from Dakota County, to talk a little bit about uh, a partnership opportunity. Uh, so the work uh, at Al Magna Park that we're proposing uh, falls under the city's Natural Resources Master Plan, which was reviewed by the commission and approved by city council in 2022. Uh, and so this uh, Natural Resources Master Plan uh, really provides the, the guide for the work that we're doing at Al Magnet Park. And it also identified uh, Al Magnet Park as a priority location for restoration activity. Uh, and then the uh, Al Magnet Park Restoration Plan uh, was created to provide some additional level of, of restoration planning detail. Then we were able to, to provide through the citywide system plan. So we're able to dig in a, a little bit further with this uh, site-specific plan. Uh, it also provides a basis for the city to participate in a city-county conservation collaborative, uh, which is a Dakota County cost share initiative, which uh, uh, Mike will be speaking a little bit more on uh, at the end here. Uh, and then it uh, provides a partnership opportunity between the city of Apple Valley, who is also uh, pursuing uh, this county program as a, a way for them to do some restoration work on their side of Al Magnet Park. Um, and if you're not familiar with Al Magnet Park, uh, the city of Burnsville uh, parkland covers about maybe 60 to 75% of the natural area. 
and 30 to 40 percent of Owl Magnet Park uh, falls within um, Apple Valley. So it's a park that uh, lies within both cities, um, and there's areas in both uh, cities that need restoration, so uh, cooperation is needed. Uh, so just uh, to pull back a little bit and talk about uh, the Alt Magnet Park, uh, a bit of an uh, overview of the ecology. Uh, so just speaking generally, um, in Burnsville historically, uh, in the 1800s from land surveyor notes, we know that uh, there was some areas of prairie, uh, some areas of oak, oak savanna and oak woods, and maybe some pockets of big woods in this area. Uh, at Alt Magnet Park, if we zoomed in a little specifically on this map, uh, at that time was a mixture of that oak savanna, oak woodland habitat, and some big woods habitat as well. And if we look at some historic, uh, historical aerial photos, uh, we can look in the 1950s uh, and see that uh, Alt Magnet Park, which is outlined in red, uh, the center there um, is where there's currently uh, turf grass and ball fields. You see, you'll see that later. Uh, the outer part of that area is the natural area. Um, and within that natural area, uh, you can see that uh, there's some sections near the lake that were more scattered and savanna-like. Uh, the southwest section of the park uh, is a bit more open, more savanna-like. And then there's other pockets more in the southeast corner of the park that are more densely wooded. And then, of course, in the, that center section was uh, more row crop agriculture at that time. Then if we look at 1985, uh, we can see that there's, uh, you know, the ball fields have been created in the, the middle section of the park. Uh, there's a park road through the middle. Um, and in the natural area, we're starting to see that some of those more open savanna woodland areas are starting to become more closed off with uh, tree cover. But there's still some open areas remaining. Uh, and then if we fast forward to 2022, uh, just last year, uh, we can see that uh, this is kind of the park as it is now. Uh, there, other than about a six acre uh, prairie unit that we have in the extreme southwest corner of the park, it's almost 100% cover of trees. Uh, so over time, we've kind of lost some of that uh, woodland and savanna uh, character of the park in some areas. So this is just a picture from this past fall during our, our uh, plan data collection. Uh, so these are some current conditions in the park, uh, pretty common for a lot of parks in the metro area. Uh, a lot of that understory, thick uh, green shrubbery, small tree looking stuff is common buckthorn, which is an invasive species, which is very aggressive and outcompetes a lot of native plants. Uh, so what we're seeing in areas where we don't have active restoration going on already is a lack of uh, diversity of native plants, uh, creating poor habitat for wildlife. Uh, we're also seeing poor tree regeneration, uh, so we don't see a lot of young trees coming through this thick buckthorn layer to replace some of our aging trees, uh, especially the oak trees, which really like a, a more sunlight. Um, and in areas uh, closer to the lake where we have steep slopes, we have more potential for erosion due to the lack of some of, of that ground cover, grasses and wildflowers. Uh, so this plan lays out some ecological restoration goals similar to our natural resources uh, system plan. And really our first priority is uh, always to maintain the work that we've already been done, that's already been done. Uh, so we don't want to forget about the, the work that we've already got going on at Alabagna Park. So we want to make sure we're doing a good job staying on top of those restoration areas. Uh, but then we want to expand uh, our restoration sites to new areas so we can continue to improve the habitat out there um, and improve the, the um, ecological benefit of that activity. Uh, and then we want to use an ecosystem approach. Uh, so we don't want to be solely focused on invasive species. We do want to control the buckthorn. We want to get rid of the bad stuff. But we also want to figure out how within our restoration work we can uh, use uh, uh, techniques that are going to promote the growth of native species. So how can we also make this site better for the native species uh, to grow and thrive? Otherwise, uh, the invasive species are always going to be the most competitive. And so one of those uh, techniques uh, that we like to use um, is using prescribed fire. 
It's a very efficient tool, um, and a lot of our native savanna and woodland habitats were adapted to the use of periodic fire uh, to help maintain that habitat. Um, so that's just one example of a, a way that we can um, efficiently maintain the habitat uh, while reducing things like pesticide use um, uh, for restoration work. And then we want to uh, always conduct a adaptive management. So with this plan that we've created, we've tried to create a good, uh, um, a good set of activities that we want to follow for the course of our restoration work. Um, but as we go along that process in year, year two, year three, year four, we want to reflect on how the work that we're doing is going uh, and see how it's actually playing out on the ground and then uh, adjust those techniques if needed. Uh, so to just kind of outline a little bit about the existing restoration areas, uh, we have uh, six acres of prairie restoration currently at the park. Uh, that's in unit 6A in the southwest corner of the park. Uh, we have some pretty large areas of woodland restoration uh, that were initiated in 2010. And if you can see the 3A, 3B sections and the 9A through 9D sections, uh, those are outlined in that uh, light blue dotted line. Uh, those are uh, existing restoration areas as well. And then more recently, the section 1A uh, along County Road 11 near the canoe launch there. Um, that's an area we've started some work with a volunteer group um, over the past couple years uh, where we have some uh, restoration activities as well. Uh, so we have some pretty big chunks that we're, we've tackled and we're still working on enhancing and maintaining, but there's quite a bit of parkland left to go. And this is just an example of one of the areas where we are actively uh, maintaining or right now. Uh, you can see on the left side, it's fairly open. You can see kind of on the understory, there's you know, some grasses. If you look closer, wildflowers and ferns in there. And there's some mixed shrubs as well. And then on the right side, it's kind of a solid green wall of vegetation. That's uh, still an area where we haven't done restoration work. So that's a common buckthorn on the right side. So you can kind of see the difference between areas where we are currently working and areas we haven't yet got to. So as part of our ongoing management for those areas, uh, we do continued work because uh, unfortunately Buckthorn isn't a you know, once and done type of uh, project where you can cut it out and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. It does take a lot of additional follow-up. Um, so we're working with volunteers and contractors and city staff to keep the Buckthorn out of the existing areas. Uh, we're also doing other invasive species control. Uh, for example, the middle fo photo here is garlic mustard. Uh, so we're working to manage other invasive species like garlic mustard in the restoration sites. Uh, then again, as I kind of mentioned, we're uh, using prescribed fire as a tool to help uh, manage some of those woodland areas, help set back some of the, the woody species like buckthorn while prom promoting that understory growth. And then as I, I mentioned, we do want to expand our restoration work at uh, Allo Magna Park. Um, and this plan uh, really focused on what we want to do over the uh, next five years. Um, so we're proposing uh, over 2023 to 2028, uh, 29 acres of uh, new restoration. And that would be likely initiated in uh, winter of 2023, 2024, so next winter. And the areas that it would focus would be uh, the areas that are outlined in light blue. So that's unit 2A and 2B, kind of on the west side near the lake. And then south of that, uh, unit 7A and 7B. Um, and that would connect up our existing prairie unit with the woodland restoration on the other side, uh, as well as our, our buckthorn removal along County Road 11 with our other removal more in the central north section of the park. So that would provide some connectivity between all our restoration sites. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't uh, complete the entire park, but a good ch uh, chunk of it. And the, the colors of the actual units here reference habitat type or habitat goals. Uh, the majority of the areas that we're proposing to restore, our, our goal would be uh, kind of an open woodland habitat. 
And then some of the areas that you see that are kind of a lighter green in that 2A unit and a little bit in the 7A unit would be more of a, a savanna target, uh, kind of grading between savanna and open woods in those areas. So a little more open in those light green sections. So uh, the, the restoration work would involve some short-term tasks that uh, would happen over the first year or two of the restoration and then some long-term tasks that would happen uh, in the first five years and then continuing. Uh, we have some examples of this type of work from Terrace Oaks Park. Uh, that was maybe a little more intensive than what we'd plan on doing at Alum Magnet as far as you know, tree thinning, um, but may use similar equipment. Uh, so to start next winter, we'd envision uh, some uh, equipment that would be out there when the ground is frozen and solid. Uh, it could be something like this feather buncher. We'd work with contractors to determine the exact type of equipment. Uh, but some type of equi equipment that can efficiently cut buckthorn or uh, uh, trees that we're trying to thin um, efficiently and effectively. And then there'd be uh, staging areas where all that woody material would be taken and then ground into chips where it could be removed from the site. And then within the first couple of years, because we know buckthorn is really aggressive and some of the other invasive species are as well, and there, there's a lot of seeds in the seed bank, uh, there's going to be quite a bit of follow-up work that's needed to try to get it under control. Uh, so we'd work with uh, contractors, volunteers, and city staff to do uh, spot spraying of buckthorn and other invasive species with herbicide. Um, we may also do some work with uh, hand brush cutting or other mechanical tools as well. And then a part of this process, as we're getting those invasive species under control, is we're going to need to reintroduce uh, native plants uh, to the landscape. There are some out there, but not enough to, to, to compete with the invasive species. Uh, so we'd uh, work with a contractor to do some seeding uh, using a UTV or smaller equipment like that. And then we also uh, like to get volunteers involved, so we would work with volunteers to seed uh, some sections of the park too. Uh, and then, yeah, the uh, long-term maintenance would involve uh, continued work to control invasive species uh, through manual methods, spot spraying of herbicide, uh, manual cutting, and also through the use of tools like uh, prescribed fire. And the end goal is we're looking to have uh, you know, healthy woodland or savanna in some areas, uh, increased uh, native tree regeneration, more grasses and uh, wildflower habita habitat underneath, and more uh, native tree regeneration. And uh, for this plan, we've been going through a, a public feedback uh, a period. Uh, we had opened a comment uh, for this plan from January 9th uh, for, uh, through February 3rd. Um, and then we also hosted an open house on January 31st. Uh, we had about uh, 15 people attend uh, and we gave a presentation on the, the plan. And we received a, uh, a lot of positive feedback um, at that meeting. And next steps for this process is uh, we're proposing to uh, draft a joint powers agreement with Dakota County. Uh, the project would take $291,000 uh, and about a 15% match would be required by the city. And that match can come through uh, uh, both city staff time, volunteer time, and also a cash match from the city. Uh, that joint powers agreement would need to be re uh, reviewed and approved by city council. And then we would look to initiate the first steps of this process uh, next winter, as far as actual on the ground restoration work. And now I just wanted to uh, quick invite Mike Lynn from Dakota County, who's been working with us throughout this whole plan process to talk a little bit about that uh, city county conservation collaborative. Right, thanks Mike. Thanks, Caleb. Madam Chair, Commissioners, I'm very happy to be here. This is a culmination of a, a process that the county has gone through. We adopted a new land. Well, first I probably should explain, back in 2003, the county started acquiring farmland easements and natural area easements. It was part of a bond referendum. For about 15 years, we didn't really, weren't uh, actively ourselves restoring 
the natural resources in those areas. Uh, but we were very successful with acquisition. But starting about f five or six years ago, we started restoring some of our uh, natural areas. And as part of it, we adopted a new land con conservation plan in about two years ago. Uh, it was decided that one of the initiatives would be to work with the cities that had city park land, just like the county. And the idea was that we were very successful with acquiring grants from the Outdoor Heritage Council and that we could funnel some of that money to uh, willing cities. So about a year ago, we, uh, or about two years ago, we asked for applications. We got five applications from five cities uh, in Dakota County. Of course, Burnsville was one of them. And, uh, and uh, with eight parks that were included in the application. So this is kind of the culmination of a, you know, a two-year process. I'm really excited that we're actually gonna get some of these going soon. Um, I think Caleb's doing a great job for your city and really, uh, you'll see that we'll, we're gonna devolve a lot of the, um, a lot of the glory, I don't know, or the, or the project management to Caleb because he's so knowledgeable in the area. And so we'll have a JPA that will define those roles and responsibilities. Uh, as he mentioned, we have a, a restoration fund, funding formula that has a pretty generous, I think, 85% split to 15% between the county and the city. And I mentioned that our funding source is uh, state grants, plus the county also commits money to these projects. So thank you for your attention. And um, I guess Caleb and I will stand for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Caleb, Mark Cleveland here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I noticed that in the w recent work, it looks like you're doing cutting and stump treatments on on mature buckthorn and other woodies that you want out. Um, uh, have you, are there any areas where you've tried to use basal bark treatment uh, as part of that seed management, the seed bank management direction? Um, that's something I've found to be effective, but it's, it's, another, it's another tool in the toolkit. I didn't, I didn't know if that's part of the plans at all. Yeah, we, uh, Historically, I haven't used a basal bark treatment as much, but we did actually use it uh, a decent amount this past year, and uh, it seemed like it was working well, so I think we'll be using more of that in the years to come. Curious also, where, where are the chips going to? Because is is, I know there was the, there was the uh, cutting for energy in the past, the city coordinated with, I'm going to guess, district energy. Is the chips going to go there, or are they going to be piled and burned or what what's happening with with that yeah there's probably a good chance they may go to some place like district energy uh, to be uh, used for to produce energy um, but that's generally uh, up to the contractor that we hire they, they're in charge of disposing oh. of the material um, but they're typically looking for low-cost methods where they can get rid of it like like that either for that or sometimes for some of it can be used for mulch or compost the problem with that, with problem with using them for compost or ch using them as chips, is that there will be fruit in them if these are live cut and stacked. So, so there's an opportunity for moving buckthorn seeds around the landscape better. So, I would think that would be something. Talking with your contractors, I, have you have you written the contracts yet? We have not. No. Oh, we're, okay. That's, we're still kind of a ways. Uh, Ways ahead of that, uh, just working on securing the funding source. Okay. And then we'll work on contracting once uh, 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 once city council approves it, and then we kind of get into the time period where we're looking to get the contract sent out for quotes, and we'd be working on that. That might be a contract requirement. Yeah, I think so. Thanks. John Hamilton, uh, regarding the land adjoining the park, is there a strategy <clears throat> to keep the invasive species on the adjoining land from coming into the park? Yeah, so uh, I think one strategy is that we want to try to build healthy native plant communities that uh, are resistant to invasive species invasion. Uh, so if we have 
a diversity of native plants uh, that just makes it harder for invasive species to spread and establish in an area. Not impossible, it just kind of slows it down. Uh, so I think trying to build those healthy native plant communities is uh, a big part of keeping invasive species out. And then another part is continued monitoring to make sure that if we have new infestations that we catch them early. And then we do offer some programs for, if it's private property, uh, residents to do their own buckthorn removal. Uh, we have a, a buckthorn pickup program that people can participate in. Uh, we have some free disposal at our city compost site, so we can offer some incentives to try to uh, work with adjacent property owners to do removal as well. Uh, but we know that we're not going to get rid of all the buckthorn in the area. Uh, that's not really not really realistic. So trying to make sure we're building these healthy native plant communities, I think, is maybe the most important. Any particular uh, plants uh, that are more effective than others? Yeah, so uh, we've had good results using a mixture of native grasses and sedges uh, to help uh, provide some really good ground cover control for um, reestablishment of buckthorn. Uh, works both as competition for those plants by taking resources and light. Uh, then it also provides some good uh, fuel or thatch layers for controlled burns. Uh, so we've found that that's pretty effective, but overall, kind of a mixture of a variety of different species uh, that just helps to, to fill the niches that are there so there's less space for a new invader to come in. So some of this work has already started, correct? Correct. Okay, and the level of success in those areas? Yeah, we've seen uh, more native plants come into those areas. Uh, we're seeing uh, so a lot of positive results. There's still quite a bit of buckthorn that uh, we're not big buckthorn, but small buckthorn that we're working to keep out and control. Um, and so I'd say we're definitely seeing a lot of positive results in those areas, but it is a long-term investment to keep invasive species out. Um, and I think one thing that's beneficial uh, is the less buckthorn in the surrounding area, kind of to your earlier question. If we're able to uh, remove buckthorn in the areas around our existing uh, restoration sites and create a bigger connected restoration, that just means there's less seeds that are spreading into the restoration sites in general. So we can protect them a little bit by expanding and making our restoration areas larger. I've got a question for Mike. Um, and it's just curious, is the county, for the five communities that were selected for, for part of this, pro, for part of this uh, cooperative program, how much is it targeted towards uh, any specific native plant community types like, like with Caleb has with, uh, and the city of Burnsville has for, you know, Oak Savannah, you know, Oak Woodland kinds of things, or, you know, is, is it also cooperative towards some of the wetland things or music hardwoods and things like that? Commissioner Cleland, we, we didn't target anything specifically with this first application round. Uh, we were just kind of interested in getting the program running. I think anticipating the future, uh, if we had a rare ecological uh, type area or a rare, rare species, uh, let's say in a county park like a Blanding's turtle, you know, we might want to gear more of our funding towards that. Okay. But at this point, a lot of our uh, city parks uh, kind of just need the basic uh, yeah. management, like removal of buckthorn and get some of the, a lot of them are oak savanna. Yeah. And a lot of the original uh, successful applicants were in the northern county, so a lot of them are oak woodlands. So kind of by default, we are focusing on uh, oak savanna as our target community. But I think in the future, you have a good suggestion that we take a look and maybe um, look for communities that are, are diverse from oak, uh, oak woodlands to also restore. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I was looking at, I was looking at the map that's, that's up, and I don't know if folks, yeah, if, I think folks can probably see that. You know, the, I was interpreting those orange blocks to be the sites and, and making an assumption that uh, just knowing where they're situated, they all seem to be uplands. 
and you know, so I was kind of curious. I think that's a, I think that's a good way to go at it. You know, there's also Rusty Patch Bumblebee that has apparently shown up on some of our city's locations, which is kind of exciting too. So, uh, the one way uh, we do we do have noticed in a lot of these parks that we do have little uh, wetlands within them. Mm -hmm. And as you're, you may be aware, those are really reservoirs of a lot of biodiversity. Uh, we haven't quite figured out how to totally restore these wetlands because often they're dominated by reed canary grass and things like that are, that are tough customers and cattails. Uh, but in the future, um, given our experience in some of the county parks, we hope to um, restore some of those areas as well. So there are some wetlands within these upland areas, but not your traditional big wetlands that are in the program. Good. Sounds, sounds like a good start. Well, thank you. Any further questions? All right. And so tonight, um, if I'm understanding correctly, we're voting to enter into a joint powers agreement with Dakota County. I think we're, uh, we requesting that the commission recommend city council enter into a joint powers agreement with Dakota County for this project. All right. Um, and do we have a motion to approve? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Thanks for your time. And now Caleb's going to stay with us and going to talk about the, an update on efforts to convert low-use turf to natural habitat over some time periods. All right. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a fairly short informational presentation about some work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, uh, converting low-use turf areas to native habitat, especially uh, prairie. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on this uh, work, um, talk about what's been done over the past couple of years, uh, what we have planned for the future, and then highlight some of the community outreach and engagement that's been done. Uh, and just a, a little background, uh, this work has been identified in a couple different plans as important work. Um, the Parks Framework Plan in 2020 uh, looked at a number of different ways to kind of align our park system with the future. Uh, part of that was identifying opportunities to reduce maintenance and improve the natural landscape. And then our Natural Resources Master Plan in 2022 also identified the goal of converting low-use turf areas to natural habitat. And then the work that we've been doing over the past couple years has been funded through Parks Framework funding and the Capital Improvement Project budget. <coughs> And so just to kind of highlight what we're talking about when we say low-use turf to native habitat, uh, this, these photos are from 2010 um, from our Civic Center uh, demonstration prairie. Uh, so right here at City Hall near Civic Center Parkway in Nicollet on the corner there. Uh, it used to be uh, uh, two acres of turf grass. And then in 2010, that was converted to native grasses and wildflowers. And that was one of the first uh, projects that the city did in this area. Um, but there hasn't been a ton of additional turf conversion <coughs> since then. We've done a little bit, um, but we've been ramping up those efforts over the past couple years. And some of the benefits of uh, converting a low-use turf to prairie include uh, reducing maintenance. So that's uh, less mowing and emissions associated with mowing. Uh, less inputs of fertilizer and herbicide on the landscape, um, and save staff, ti uh, staff time for our, our park staff to work on other projects. Uh, it also increases wildlife habitat for you know, butterflies, bees, including the rusty patch bumblebee, which we have here at Civic Center Park at our conversion area, um, and other uh, birds and other habitat. Uh, and it also increases uh, groundwater infiltration um, from the deep roots of the prairie, prairie plants and native, uh, native plants. So that uh, soaks up more groundwater and reduces stormwater runoff. Uh, the prairie plants uh, increase carbon storage by um, taking up carbon and uh, storing it in their root systems, which gets incorporated in, into the soil. 
And then it also becomes a new type of park amenity. So it's not just about the wildlife and the critters. Uh, people can enjoy these areas as well by taking photos, you know, watching birds. Um, just adds a, a different dynamic to some of the parks that isn't always there. Uh, so we've been able to establish a couple different partnerships and collaborations uh, through the work that we've been doing. Uh, one is working with XL Energy through their pollinator initiative program. Uh, so one of the, the turf conversions at Lake Park was under uh, power lines. So we're able to work with XL uh, and have them do some of the prep work. And then the city did other components of that project. Uh, so that was a nice partnership. Uh, then we've also been working with Dakota County Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, and they have a, a native prairie restoration cost share program. Uh, so we've been able to get uh, some really good matching funds um, and also work with uh, the SWCD staff and their expertise to get the projects installed. Uh, and then, uh, of course, working with our own city, uh, city Parks and Recreation Department uh, as well. And so work to date uh, over the past three years, uh, we've converted about nine acres of low-use turf uh, to native plantings. At Lake Park, we did a two-acre conversion. That's the site that was under the, the power lines. At Highland View Park, uh, we did a one-and-a-half-acre uh, conversion. At North River Hills Park, we did 5.4 acres. And then we did a small conversion, a, a tenth of an acre, at Crystal West Park in uh, a parking lot, uh, Center Island. And then uh, on the right here on this slide, you can see an example of one of those parks. Uh, the area is, this is Highland View Park. Uh, the areas in yellow were the two uh, turf conversion areas. Uh, and so you can see that uh, there wasn't a lot of existing natural habitat at this park. It was primarily uh, turf grass. Um, so this will add a little more dimension of high quality uh, native habitat at the park. Um, but still, there's lots of turf space left for turf activities in this area. And just a couple photos of the sites. Uh, the prairies take a little while to establish, so we don't have a, a ton of uh, photos of established prairies yet, because that takes a few years. Um, but the photo on the left is of the tractor installing seed at North River Hills. And uh, the oldest project so far is the 2020 Lake Park project. You can see that's starting to come in with some flowers and grasses. And for upcoming work, uh, we're uh, planning on doing a eight tenths of an acre uh, conversion at Interlochen Park uh, in southeast Burnsville. And then a, a smaller two tenths of an acre conversion at uh, Alamagnet Magnet Park. So we've got a couple other projects uh, that we're, we've got uh, planned for this upcoming year. And then one thing we've been uh, working hard to do with this project is uh, to do public outreach, uh, both because we want to let the public know what, uh, what we're doing in the parks, um, but also because it provides an opportunity to, to talk to residents about how they can plant native plants on their own property. Uh, so we've been doing that in different ways, uh, and I've snipped out a few examples of that here on this slide. Uh, left to right, we had an article in the local Sun paper on the Lake Park project. Uh, we recently put together a nice uh, YouTube video on some of the turf conversion efforts, um, which you can find on the city website. Uh, we've been using social media to promote the, the plantings uh, when they happen. Uh, and also putting articles in our, our uh, city Burnsville Bulletin. Uh, and then uh, this work, along with some other projects that the city has done, was also uh, highlighted in the city receiving the Outstanding Conservationist Award in 2021, uh, which was nice to, to receive that award, but it also provided an opportunity for us to again highlight uh, the, the positive work of doing, uh, adding new habitat in some of these parks. And then we, uh, in addition to kind of the more passive public outreach of you know, uh, articles and putting stuff on social media, we also wanted to do some more directed engagement. Uh, COVID put a damper on that for the first couple years of this work, um, but we're able to get started uh, with that last year. 
Right. Uh, so this past fall, we did uh, a planting event at uh, our North River Hills conversion area where we invited the public to come out uh, and plant uh, flowers and shrubs. Uh, we selected some species that are kind of hard to establish from seed or some of the shrubs that are very early blooming so we can try to fill some niches that we didn't already have through our seed mix that was installed there. Um, and it also provides a nice opportunity to engage uh, with uh, people that uh, live in the area or are interested in the parks um, and, and, and teach them about the new habitat. Um, so that uh, event went great. We had 26 volunteers come out. Um, and one, one thing that we're, we did with this project and we'd like to continue is we're really trying to you know, promote through our typical methods, uh, but also we put out yard signs uh, in the park, so on the trails and on the sidewalk near these areas that invited people to attend. So the people that are actually living around these parks and that are seeing the changes will see, this, see the sign, they can come out and help out and feel involved in the process as well. Uh, so we're hoping to kind of continue that if we're doing more of these types of projects to uh, do these types of planting events to uh, invite people to help out. Um, yeah, and with that, I would uh, be happy to take any questions the commissioners have. So long-term long -term maintenance of these, I'm assuming you're looking at, at fire as an important tool and in places like under the power lines, you would probably work with Excel for mowing. Would they, would they, will they be participating in the maintenance? The maintenance would probably be uh, the city and there have been situations where we can get permitted to do prescribed fire under power lines and we work with Excel to do that. And if we can't, then yes, we'd be using mowing with city staff. It's a, it's a benefit for the power lines to not have tall woody things like trees underneath them that require management. So this is a this is probably one of those win-win situations that uh, we like to look like to see the city doing that. That's great. Thank you. I'm curious, is there a way to measure the changes in the storm water runoff? Um, I'm, there's no way for the city to do that. I guess we're not really set up with the tools to do that. And I'm not aware of any specific research that I've seen that has measured that. So I guess I, I'd say I'm not aware of any way to do that uh, specifically. You could create it. I'd like to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'd be interesting to see some data on the differences between the storm drain runoffs with and without native plantings to help mitigate that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be... Someday. Uh, I think it would be interesting, and I, I'm, I'm sure that there's some people out there that have gotten at that in, in some ways. I'm just not specifically aware of it offhand. But I'm, I'm sure there's been some research on that topic. Sounds good. Just kind of, in, you bring up an interesting point on the runoff um, are any of these sites potential um, this term rain garden you know rain rain garden kind of targets because I know the city has done some initiatives on that regard uh, and one would think there might be some low-hanging fruit here with, uh, with with some of the parks as well so I don't know if that's if that's part of the future game plan or not but uh, be interesting to explore that as you know because they're going to have a lot of overlapping species you know from the upland going down and into the wetter areas and transitioning so be an interesting interesting to see if there's any opportunities for that yeah yeah so far none of our projects have incorporated rain gardens or they've mostly been upland areas um, but i think if there were opportunities to maybe capture runoff from an adjacent parking lot uh, and do more of a basin like a rain garden, uh, I think we'd be interested in doing that. Just hasn't really presented itself so far. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, there's no action required on our end. I thank you so much for joining us this evening, Caleb. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for your time.
And now we're going to move over to JJ Ryan, who's going to discuss the election of chair and vice chair for 2023. Sure. Uh, commissioners, each year, usually in January, we elect a chair and a vice chair to serve for uh, 12 months. And uh, typically, like I said, that happens in January. We did not have a January meeting, so it is uh, in front of you tonight. Um, it went out in the background that I would have accepted nominations ahead of time. I did not receive anything. So tonight I am looking for someone to nominate a chair and vice chair to serve um, our commission through 2023. Uh, I'm Mark Cleveland. I, I like to move to place the current chair and vice chairs uh, into nomination so to continue their roles for the Parks and Natural Resources Commission. Is there a second? I'll second, second that. Thank you. Are there any other um, recommendations? All right. Uh, seeing none, uh, move forward with a motion from Commissioner Cleveland, second by ha Mr. Hamilton, to approve Chair Woolman and Vice Chair uh, Dabu uh, through. January 2024. All in favor? Aye. 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 You opposed? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. No coup tonight. <laughs> no coup tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and now we move to the miscellaneous portion of our agenda tonight. Uh, commissioners, I would like to first welcome um, our, our newest youth commission member, uh, Peter Mendez, to the commission. Tonight is his first night serving, so thank you for being here. I'm, I'm hoping that you enjoyed your time with us tonight, and we'll look forward to having you serve with us for the rest of the year. Thank you. Um, as noted earlier, uh, Chair Woolman, you mentioned that the Alamagna pickleball court discussion was moved to March 6th. So for anyone looking to participate in that discussion, Please come back in March um, and, and join us right here, March 6th, for that discussion. Um, you may also see in your packet, commissioners, that um, I've attached the 2023 work plan. Um, just given the strange calendar we've had from December to January, um, and we added some things as we approved the work plan in January, I wanted to make sure that you all had uh, the copy of that. That, that item is not open for discussion tonight, but I just wanted to make sure that you see that I captured the items that you requested on that, uh, on that draft. And um, commissioners, you are also welcome to attend the city council meeting tomorrow night at 530, where Chair Woolman will be presenting our work plan to city council, asking for uh, their input and approval on our 2023 work plan. So that is what I have for you tonight, commissioners. Thank you. At this time, I would like to call for an adjournment of the February 6th, 2023 Parks and Natural Resources Commission meeting. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I motion we adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And with that, we will see you next month on March 6th or tomorrow night.